fingers for a while. Welcome to uh, our latest element of evolution, a continuing saga of replacing Darwin, misrepresenting sources in a way so typical of Christ's. Uh, you will see upon the screen, uh, whoop, there we go, that way, um, our, uh, our dear and noble patrons who help in every way to keep the project going week after week, all down to the time when we can do even more books and annoy creationists even more thoroughly. So, <clears throat> starting up a little bit early, but that should be okay. Um, Daryl Jensen is continuing his One Note Charlie dangling of footnotes for homozygous mutations. And uh, this time around, he brings up whales, or one particular whale. Oh, hi, Vandalia. Lamont. Welcome aboard in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, part two, which I will alert just in case we have a signal foul up. Um, Frank Sherwin, a couple years ago, I'm plowing through all of the acts and facts uh, for the new book to make sure that all of the crap that's been put in uh, at an uh, Institute for Creation Research relevant to the various points that we bring up, brought up to speed as we move up to 2023. Anyway, back in 2020, he put an article up at ICR about uh, metabolic pathways as a way to God. And you go, hmm? well, basically this was the argument that somehow metabolic systems uh, and the various pathways of metabolics are um, inscrutably, irreducibly complex. Hello, Barbara. Um, and to that end, uh, he quote mined uh, several works to cast doubt on the evolutionary alternative on said metabolic pathways. Um, fortunately, they're available open access. So um, I'm going to be putting up a link to uh, Fanny 2012, which is a general review of the field within the context of actually the origin of life and origins of bust issue, um, all of which details Sherwin left out. Surprise, surprise. Uh, then there was a 2018 paper, much more recent, uh, by Noda Garcia, uh, which is more specifically related to uh, the origin and evolution of the main pathways of life after all of that has appeared. And uh, it's a quite uh, detailed annual reviews paper. Um, Sherwin just nicked one little quote from it, which is, quote, the emergence of the pathways that now comprise core and central metabolism or even intermediate metabolism is particularly enigmatic, unquote. That actually was a summary of the state of the situation before their paper and uh, cited a 1967 paper on that matter. Uh, in other words, decades older. Uh, but uh, Sherwin skipped the content of all of the stuff that had been worked out after 1967. So um, you can judge for yourself who has the better end of the argument just from those two papers comparing it with what Sherwin had to do. So that's the part two part. We're out of the way on that. Back to our little friends, the whales. Uh, Jackson and I are going to be having a whole big section in volume two of The Rocks Were There on Whales because of course we've got a glut of fossils that weren't available in the 1990s um, and um, masses of genetic information, things on the development of baleen whales, elements on the development of fins, uh, flippers and all of that stuff. Um, tooth structures, uh, an enormous amount of material that's um, been done by this over the years. Now, Jensen, remember this is a 2017 book, Boo, um, was nicking off of this paper by Yim from 2014 on specifically the genome of the minke whale, one little teeny slice. It was a perfectly fine paper, uh, as you'll find out because we'll be putting up the link to it, um, on um, working out the genetics of extant whales and figuring out what genetic mutations are involved in the adaptation to an aquatic environment since they didn't start out aquatic, they started out terrestrial vertebrates. Um, even in their abstract, they gave a heck of a lot of information about which, of course, Jensen discussed zero because all he was doing it was dangling it as a little footnote uh, on this supposed mutation in homozygous uh, versus uh, heterozygous connotation. 
The quote that uh, in the abstract, however, says, our comparative genomic analysis identified an expansion in the whale lineage of gene families associated with stress response proteins and anaerobic metabolism, whereas gene families related to body hair and sensory receptors were contracted. By the way, it turns out that all hairless mammals have the genes for making hair, which is, seems an odd detail. It's like putting a gas tank on a Tesla, but you know, who's to say? That's a more recent paper, by the way, that's uh, that just came out, I think, just a couple months ago. Anyway, our analysis also identified whale-specific mutations in genes encoding antioxidants and enzymes controlling blood pressure and salt concentration. Overall, the whale genome sequences exhibited distinct features that are associated with the physiological and morphological changes needed for life in an aquatic environment, marked by resistance to physiological stresses caused by a lack of oxygen, increased amounts of reactive oxygen species, and high salt levels. So we've got, oh, if whales started out as land animals, then why are there still land animals? Exactly so, yes. And if, if I'm descended from um, my great-great-grandparents and they have children as cousins. Why didn't the cousins all drop dead when I was born? I can't figure that one out. It's a, it's a strange, it's a mystery. It's, it's a mystery. Anyway, um, a couple lessons come up from this whale matter. One is that zero of the work on it is done by anti-evolutionists. I don't know of anybody in the field that's actually contributed anything notably. Two, um, there's an awful lot of work that's going on. And what you can do uh, in uh, checking out this uh, YIM paper is just seeing the array of information that was being explored at that point and think about what might be happening in the now almost decade uh, since then in terms of working out ever more detail that presumably uh, Jensen in the trace book probably won't be able to discuss it all because it's all about human evolution. Um, and then the other aspect of when are they going to come up with a model for what they think did happen with them. So you've got the work that they're not doing on that front, and then you have all this fossil and genetic information that keeps on piling up that ever improves our understanding of things and opens up avenues of research because in order to get from a terrestrial organism to uh, an aquatic one, things are going to have to happen and you can study it. Now, the interesting little question mark knocking around doesn't have anything to do with Jensen. It has to do with a as-yet-to-appear paper from the intelligent design movement uh, that I've been waiting for and waiting for and waiting for and hearing what's going on. Gunter Beckley uh, teased about this little tome uh, to uh, Erica um, last year. And uh, supposedly, they're going to be doing this wonderful thing about the details of why the the evolution of whales couldn't possibly have happened. There's too much that has to go on in too short of a period of time. Uh, this is a thing that's been dangling as well from uh, Joseph Sternberg, who is the fellow that had a big flap over um, uh, intelligent design issues at uh, a Smithsonian-related uh, um, taxonomical magazine back, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. And he's been edging ever so closely more and more into the intelligent design movement. He also had been asserting that whales couldn't possibly have developed that quickly. And he's been doing some lectures around at various intelligent design conferences on this. I too have been waiting for the paper that he would write to explain this in detail with those pesky little footnote things to where you'd be able to actually see what assertions he's making on the fossil record, what assertions he's making on the genetic data and finding out whether or not that stuff is actually all that up to date or leaving out parts that don't fit and also what is their model of what they think happened um were they specially created uh were they magically modified from existing organisms what do they ex exactly think going on we know the model that uh oh time is just an anthropomorphic convention so uh, so no worries yes uh time is the way nature does things so everything that doesn't happen all at once It'd be awfully awkward if that were okay. Otherwise, you'd be in a Michelle Yu movie, which, by the way, I have yet to see. That um, it's gotten just splendid reviews, and, and Michelle Yu could read the phone directory, as far as I could tell, uh, and I would be uh, delighted in it. And it's got uh, Jamie Lee Curtis in it too. So I mean, well, I, worth it right there. But I have not had a chance to see everything 
everywhere all at once, I think is the title of it. Anyway, I digress because remember, I'm a science fiction fan and a science fiction writer. So um, what we're going to be looking for in the next years is to see just what, if anything, um, the intelligent design model is going to present and what in heck is going to go on in the creationist thing. As it happens, uh, for those of you who've been following the channel over quite a while, uh, you will be aware of the fact, as anybody that's been following the creationist movement would be aware of, is that Kurt Wise, uh, a little ways back, um, blithely argued that aquatic whales developed after the flood, that a terrestrial ancestor for the whales would be on board the ark, from which whales develop lickety split, don't ask for too many details. Uh, this is a handy way of getting around some problems uh, and dealing with some of the fossil record. And even the ark encounter flirts at that in the way that they depict Pachycetus and all of that. Um, but not all creationists are agog with that. And so there's just a brand new thing that has come out uh, where um, uh, one of their creationists at AIG is trying to drop the boom on Kurt Wise and Todd Wood and various other ones who, in their view, are compromising too much with the evolutionary paradigm. The problem is, for, for poor old AIG, is this is an inevitable problem. Because remember, unlike the intelligent design model that theoretically accepts the big time frame, so they can have whales appearing with some degree of vague, unspecified design uh, dribbling out over millions of years if they feel like it. Creationists don't have that option. Uh, a doctrinal creationist, young earth creationists require only one creation event during the creation week. All extant organisms, all the things that have ever lived were created, the kinds that were involved were created during the creation week, stop. No creation after that point. So then you've got the created kinds and they're doing their little kindy thing, proliferating into the various critters that we see. By the way, we're talking about a time frame of about a thousand years from the creation week to the big slosh flood. So all of the diversity that we're seeing in the fossil record that's functionally preserved in the flood, according to their big slosh model, uh, all of that had to have taken place within that thousand years or so. Then the little critters march on to the ark. Don't ask about the insects. Don't ask about marine critters and all this kind of, which of course whales would be in that category. Um, uh, if the whales were created as sea creatures prior to the flood, but in which case, why don't they only show up in the top layers and not down there swimming next to some hapless plesiosaur? You know, they have little fiddly bit details that they can't quite get around to. Anyway, um, the critters come off of the ark, roughly 1,500 kinds if you go with the Answers in Genesis model. And that's part of the things that's going to be explored in one of the big appendixes uh, in the new book is just what all are they talking about here and how do they handle all of this stuff? Um, and the implications that Jensen's book has, pro or con, as to whether or not their model in Answers in Genesis even, even can work. But still, all those little critters come off of the ark, and then they proliferate. And how quickly do they proliferate into all, let me underline that, all of the extant species? So how fast do they do in that? There's a bottleneck that occurs because... People start observing critters and writing them down, and the Greeks are noticing them, and Romans and Chinese and all these other things. And of course, we have an archaeological record for some of this stuff and all this stuff. Um, and, well, <laughs> um, to be fair, uh, Lamont, um, in the creation model, leaving aside insects and all that stuff and all the little kind of rinks and all those little phyla that, that marine creatures and stuff that the uh, uh, creationists don't want to bother about. Uh, of the 1,500 kinds that were brought on board the ark, according to Answers in Genesis, which is the smallest number of kinds of anything in the creationist literature, more of the which stuff we're going to be going into in, in volume two of the rocks for there. But anyway, the thing is that... Um, Oops. Uh, is that 
about 55% of those drop dead after um, the uh, flood event. After, and exactly how fast that happened? Uh, if it, <laughs> yes, that. Uh, yes, the AIG model is like what happens if you open a box of car parts and and pour epoxy in it, then call it a car. That's practically um, it, because, or rather, that they have segments of cars that they just kind of they have existing automobiles to work with but they have to look at all of the parts very very carefully and uh the, the example that i used once um about transitional forms uh related to like finding a buick in a um uh a, a junkyard and the um uh, per, the creationist is somebody that announces there cannot possibly be any buicks uh, which would be a transitional form as just an abstract uh, analogy and you come up with a hood from a, with a B and a U and a space with the two dots where the I would have been in a CK. And they go, no, 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 no. That says Buck. That doesn't say Buick. No, no, no. You have to, that, that clearly does not show that Buicks existed. And that's in a nutshell what basically goes on in creationist foot dragging when it comes to uh, intermediate forms and the like, because they never tell you what they would accept. Doesn't the BU with the dot dots and the CK, isn't that a Buick <laughs> part? Uh, no. Uh, and so it, it's undisprovable from their point of view, and you can never get them to figure anything out, which is why uh, creationist systematics never gets anywhere. Uh, it doesn't happen at all over in the intelligent design side. And frankly, it doesn't occur at all over in what's left of the um, uh, old earth creationist, the reasons to believe crowd, which if you follow um, uh, uh, you Ross lately, he's basically rhapsodizing about his own field, which is astronomy. So he's talking about exoplanets and all this kind of stuff, which he can theoretically put into there. Uh, you get the hints of paleontological stuff from Fazal Rana, but not a great deal. And as I pointed out, in some cases directly to them, um, that um, I've yet to see anything from reasons to believe on the reptile mammal transition data. What the hell are we going to do? be fun to see what Gunter Beckley would have to say about that if he ever writes a monograph, because he sort of implied that he doesn't really have a problem with that uh, data field. And so who knows where that's going to go either. And he scampers off to other stuff. That popped up in uh, the discussion that he had with Erica when he was a guest on her show uh, last year or the year before last, maybe it may have been that long ago. Um, and in fact, I think it was pre-pandemic. Uh, so maybe it was that far back. Anyway, uh, and of course, that also means GM created all automobiles. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. The uh, um, uh, and of course the, the you always have to be wary with using automobiles as an analogy here because as we know Philip Johnson made a big hay about uh, in fact it's called Barra's blunder. Um, Jonathan Wells trots it out every once in a while, where uh, Barra was simply using Corvettes as uh, an analogy for how you can use systematics to classify things. He wasn't implying that Corvettes breed and make little baby Corvettes, which if they did, spoiler alert, um, they would all uh, be governed by Darwinian principles rather than engineering principles, because that's how replicating systems that have inherited mutations work. But anyway, uh, beside that. So back to our little friends, the whales. Um, the issue then will be to what extent the gang at AIG are going to coalesce around um, a bit that will want to be dumping on that, which seems a peculiar thing to do since branches of AIG at the ARC encounter are functionally kind of following the baromenologists here. So there's going to be kind of like a devouring of one another going on at that level. ICR is over in another ballpark there. Uh, their obsessions are just kind of repeating the same tropes that Oh, Carrion has uh, Clary and his mega sequences and uh, Guliusa and his uh, um, oh, um, continuous environmental tracking CET thing, which is going to uh, get some discussion because it's it's come up with uh, Danster and Cardinelli and others that uh, um, trying to out outmode natural selection. And in all of that, then the whales are kind of off in a corner. Um, I haven't seen a huge amount on it. Um, in the ICR literature of all that late. And um, anyway, we'll be reviewing all of that stuff and there's a big pile of material. 
uh, on the um, uh, creationist approach to whales. It, they popped up a little bit in Johnson's, uh, Philip Johnson's old Darwin on trial. Uh, he was basically riffing off of Michael Denton's version, which since Michael Denton's book was from the 1980s and Denton was relying on stuff kind of in the 1960s, needless to say, it didn't have a heck of a lot of connection up to, to recent material. So um, uh, there's selection pressure on automobiles, though. It's called, uh, um, yes, customer preference. Indeed. And that can buck up against the dynamics that come into play. Um, now we're into social systems and how they run. Um, where uh, legislation enters into the picture. So uh, cars, there was a certain interest, for example, in safety in automobiles after World War II. And Chevrolet, for example, offered as options, padded dashes, seat belts, all that kind of stuff. And people looked at the extra cost they'd have to have on that. And they said, yeah, nah, we'll, we'll just skip it. So basically um, those features that are ubiquitous on cars today, and rightly so for anybody that's ever been in an accident and knows how useful they are, um, are there functionally not because a good idea was marketed and the population just suddenly said, ooh, great, we'll put God, buy a car with seat belts. Uh, it's because they were mandated by the government. And so airbags, and I think now it's point of anti-lock brakes, and uh, I think backup cameras are now becoming um, uh, required on things. It, there's a reinforcement mechanism that goes on here in terms of insurance rates, where it's safer with a car uh, to the point of where my modern hybrid that's got safety features up the yin-yang um, actually has lower insurance than the less expensive old car that I had that didn't have all of those features. So there you go in terms of market. Uh, but the, so the idea of that, um, another feature in relation to personal preference and marketing has to do with how much of that's guided by the marketing of the companies versus how much is just a genuine interest. So we've seen um, an area where the proliferation of what I would call shrunken station wagons uh, SUVs and the like, some of them built on car platforms, some of them built on truck platforms. Uh, but they um, um, have functionally started to dominate all of the automobile industry and are gradually fading away conventional sedans and all of that because uh, people just don't typically want to buy them. And as an old fart like me, I'm looking at the fact that by the time I upgrade to a plug-in electric, um, it... Um, may be the case that a conventional sedan type model, simply nobody makes them anymore. They, they would be completely extinct by then. Uh, so you've got all that factors that's going along now in the old days, the glorious days of planned obsolescence, uh, when you had the big three car makers and little pimple groups with Studebaker and a few of these other ones, uh, where they would be getting you into the mood of having to have a car every year uh, or every few years. Uh, I can tell you how glaringly different anybody that's that's not an old fart um, has probably never seen a world in which cars became obsolete so quick. So the next time you're out driving, uh, just look at the cars around you. First of all, most of them are going to be SUVs. <laughs> just and and um, uh, and so even spotting a sedan will be not impossible. But nevertheless, much less that you may you can mark up how many sedans you see versus how many electric vehicles you you're, you're starting to see. And if you are in like Seattle, uh, you know there's an awful lot of those. Even uh, some uh, are becoming more and more um, uh, frequent. I see little Teslas all the time uh, here in Spokane, uh, which is a much smaller demographic. But when you've got um, try to look for a vehicle that's older. So, and how would you identify a vehicle that's older? Could you tell by sight what a 2010 car looks like? Remember, that's 13 years old. Can you see easily a, a 2005 car? Can you spot one of those? Can you uh, tell, well, when you go back maybe into the 1990s, yeah, they're starting to look a little bit different. The headlights maybe have the kind of smudgy quality because they're not using um, they're using regular headlamps and they've got little plastic covers over them rather than uh, the newer stuff, which is uh, LEDs and quartz uh, lights and halogens and all that stuff. Um, but the shape of the thing is often very difficult to do. I, I think of um, 
uh, say a 1997 Ford Taurus uh, that doesn't look ridiculously antiquated. And that's, yipes, you know, it's, it's uh, over 20 years old. Now, I would know back in my day, I almost never saw a car that was more than just a few years old and it stood out like a sore thumb. Uh, so in 1962 or so, uh, a 1957 car that my brother bought, uh, which would be five model years old, looked like it was like ancient. And if somebody had driven up in a 1952 car, which would have been 10 years old, my gosh, you know, oh, horrors. Now imagine uh, driving up in a car that was 20 years old, a 1942 automobile. I never saw anything that old. Once in a while, you'd see somebody with a little vintage old car, some little old Ford that they were doing as a, uh, a hot rod or uh, some such thing, and they were they were as rare as hen's teeth. Those cars, of course, looked like if they were from another planet because they were so ancient. So, um, uh, yeah, the, um, the factors that came into play, because I've been studying this in terms of the evolution of car design, what a, what a digression to go into. Um, because you know, in part in relation to what's going to happen in the future. Um, some of it had to do with the development of the safety rules. So those of you who remember cars from the 1980s uh, into the 1990s can remember the big bumpers that stuck out in the front and the back. I like to think of them as the Habsburg lip cars, mm. like that. And that was because they had to attach an actual functional bumper onto the frame of the car because the bumpers that were in cars prior to that time didn't really do anything. <laughs> now, eventually they all changed. Uh, oh, yes, 1951. That, dear hearts, is before I was born. How dare you have a vehicle that old? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, back to the, um, uh, the thing of it, that the development of crumple zones on automobiles and the development of fuel efficiency Cafe standards meant that the vehicles had began to shift over to aerodynamic designs. Another feature that came into play um, was something that was driven by consumer preference. And I like to call it the BMW, um, oh, V6 or 8. Oh, my gosh. I, I would be flabbergasted if that truck had other than a V8. But you can uh, tell us, GUP, uh, because... Um, uh, in the back in those days, from what I understand from the relatives, oh, six straight block, my oh my, did that have much poop to it? Because my understanding was that six cylinder engines were relatively underpowered in those days. Uh, and um, so my mom, for example, would never get a car that, that didn't have an eight cylinder engine in it because it had no, a six had no pep in those days. Nowadays, I suppose my little four cylinder Honda uh, could, could blow the socks off of it because of that. And that, that goes back to the reason why cars started looking the way they are now. And partly it is the BMWization of the car that starting really in the eighties on as yuppies bought their three series BMWs, um, everybody wanted those features, which was ultimately to have a little sports sedan car that had better handling, better braking, better acceleration. Uh, they didn't need to have a very large automobile so they could take a standard car size and incorporate all of the BMW style features. And so in my own driving experience, uh, I went to the stage where cars started having standard equipment with tachometers. Uh, cars started developing more and more of them with bucket seats and a center console with a stick shift, uh, down, the shift lever down on the console, not up on the top uh, with the uh, steering column. Um, the elimination of white wall tires as an unnecessary affectation, the uh, uh, less and less chrome in cars. Now, modern vehicles, now that you have that crumple zone design uh, with an aerodynamic shell over it, all of the zone of the physical outside of the cars made of like polymer plastics and that relatively little sheet metal involved in it. That was another thing to get, cut down on weight. Um, uh, more and more aerodynamics, smaller and smaller, more, and more powerful engines, so that the four-cylinder engines that, that we have now can blow the socks off of what would have been considered a, a powerful engine for a, even a V8 uh, back in the 40s and 50s. The trunks, <clears throat> because of that arrow-shaped design, they get shorter and relatively taller, they, and, and slightly smaller, frankly. So the old behemoths 
that I remember from the 1960s where you could put quite a few dead bodies in them if you were a mafia uh, killing, uh, get, you know, it, it, it's harder to cram things into the trunk. Even on uh, like a high-end Cadillac, you open up like an SDS and it's got this little itty bitty small trunk in there. So um, it's, uh, oh, um, yeah, the, um, uh, in a way, it's true. Red right? once in Europe, the car was built to fit the cities. In America, the cities were built to get the cars. Yeah, that, that it's partly true because you have to remember how recently so many of the cities are. Europe doesn't have new cities. They've had cities where people have been living in there for, for centuries. So they already have their little avenues. Unless you're in like Paris, where Baron Hausmann just starts taking meat cleavers to the avenues and bulldozing out the poor people and laying in these giant boulevards um, uh, back in the 1850s. Uh, most of the cities have to make do with the superstructure that they have. London, all of these other places had to build up in that context. Uh, Berlin had a little bit different element because it was a relative backwater city until it became the uh, head of the uh, empire. And so there was a degree of urban development that took place kind of late in its thing. But compare that, uh, you've got old cities like New York and that on the East Coast. But Spokane, Washington didn't exist until the 1870s, and its street systems were all laid out um, uh, in a way that kind of windy little streets up on top of the hills and long avenues as the city expanded out past the, the little center area along by the river. Um, if you were like something like Salt Lake that was founded by Mormons, uh, Brigham Young laid it out like a gigantic grid system and did a thing where he could turn a, a rig of horses, like a team of eight horses and a wagon, something like that, uh, do a UE in the middle of Union Street that runs down the thing from uh, Temple Square uh, and the Capitol. And um, uh, that's why that big avenue is so wide and it's perfectly fine for environment today. Uh, places like Los Angeles had their explosion in a period when the automobile was starting to come in. They still had streetcar lines and eventually those got replaced by buses, which involves a whole secondary thing about how General Motor and Goodyear got together and conspired to kill off the trolley cars. Um, all of that um, uh, is part of the grisly history of things. But the, generally speaking, in the West, where you had miles and miles of nothing, um, there was a tremendous incentive to have now paved roads and ultimately interstate highways. And then you got into another area entirely, which was how to connect all of these things up. And here we have another social factor where uh, if you look at, and people have done studies on this kind of thing, that if you look where the freeways went, when they, when they encounter a rich neighborhood, they go around it. If they encounter a poor neighborhood, they go right over it or through it. And they're now having to redress the fact that this has had a tremendous impact of the way Robert Moses was doing highway development in that in New York City. Uh, and uh, uh, this is true of an awful lot of the interstate system that was developed. So all of that, uh, a lot of the Euro cities are restructuring for bikes. Yeah, well, and you, of course, you've got now electric bikes and stuff, Spokane. We've got a bunch of these things and you find them all over the place in Seattle and that as well. These little things that you just put your little credit card thing and whoop, you go running off on a little um, electric uh, moped. Uh, and uh, the diversification of systems, uh, Seattle is kind of clunking along building um, a um, uh, elevated uh, train uh, system. Um, and of course they've got such a maze of highways and streets. There, there was a place that if you wanted to figure an environment that would be terrible to put cars into, and yet they did it anyway, uh, the, the whole C, uh, Seattle area with all of those lakes and hills and obstacles floating around on stuff. Although I, I will say one thing that really strikes me about Seattle as a city is how much of the wilderness and greenery they've left. So you can easily drive in through urban environments and the suburbs in Seattle and you're driving through forest practically. And you realize that there's like buildings over past there and you come down suddenly and there are you intersections and, and malls and then suddenly there's more trees. Uh, it's an astonishing amount of stuff that goes on. Um, oh yeah, um, yeah, the, the it, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, the, every city has their own little dynamic. Uh, places that are blocked in by the real estate operate in a rather different way than the places that have open expansion zones. So um, San Francisco, for example, like Seattle, is on a structure that 
hems them in. There's a peninsula that San Francisco is on, and the only way you're going to expand is south. And so there's a bunch of suburbs community come down there, and the BART system, and that connects up all of that. Uh, Los Angeles, that whole area from the Pacific Coast um, east, um, is all open territory uh, and gradually gets filled in as a series of little bedroom communities that expands. Uh, and this was taking place even before the interstate highways were developed. Uh, by the time we start getting more and more of the freeways that are coming in in the 1950s and 60s, some of which was still under construction by the time that uh, I moved down there. I still remember that um, uh, my uh, uh, mom, when we would go on our um, couple times a year visits to Disneyland, um, we never took the uh, freeway to get to it. Uh, we would drive through the back door, uh, which at the time, for years and years and years, was all orchards and open area, and you could see the Matterhorn from a very long way away. Now, uh, it's just wall-to-wall -wall urban environment everywhere, everywhere, and more f freeways have come through. Even the iconic Spaghetti Bowl, which was an incredibly complicated exchange where a bunch of interstates came together. Um, that has been removed and replaced by a different set of spaghetti bowls that, that don't have quite the same iconic look uh, of the ones from the 1950s. So even they've gone through things. The problem is, uh, well, in a way, we're in a kind of training wheel period on transportation because we're moving into an electric era, which will upset a lot of the dynamics of what was thinking about transportation and self-driving cars and all of this to where um, the dynamic about you'd want to have public transit because it's more environmental and it carries people more efficiently, that variable isn't quite the same when you're dealing with electric vehicles. And uh, the fact that you can now have a device that is environmentally uh, friendly that will carry you from what you want to do in, in a, a vehicle that can take the most efficient path and all that stuff. Same reason why there's a different dynamic between an electric bus versus a, a fixed line railroad where everything is running along an already existing superstructure. Um, some areas, some countries have kind of gotten into a, a different realm. We don't know what's gonna be happening in, in, in some of these areas um, in uh, Asia, uh, in India, where um, there's like 300 million people living in a suburban situations out of a billion people, which means they're still a minority, but that's bigger than the entire population of the United States. Um, clearly, sprawl and inconvenience and the need to have a livable space where you can get out of whatever vehicle it is, whether it's a transit car or a, a subway or whatever, and, and interact human beings one-to-one, -one, um, that kind of thing is, is a bit where urban planning and design uh, is operating at all levels. So you can see the old elevated rail lines in some cases that have been abandoned in New York City are being turned into pedestrian walkways and restaurants are cropping up around them and all that. So you can get a, a new repurposing of things. We theoretically should be doing that with all empty lots, uh, abandoned buildings. Uh, the, the, there's a, just a tremendous amount of wasted real estate that's doing nothing because the old purposes have faded away. And so you've just got this rotting hulk sitting there like Stonehenge and it's not as pretty. Um, that's true for abandoned factories in the East and all of that. And, and we have yet to really work out uh, a civic policy that can really dive into that effectively and probably won't be able to come up with such a policy so long as you have nincompoops like the rhino Trumpistas, you know, in Congress. But anyway, um, yes, back to the whale somehow. <laughs> now the cost, yes, a whale of a tail. Um, the whales, I suppose, could be thought of uh, in a group that um, have been a, a, until, of course, the notions about predation and ocean pollution and a few other things like that, have been a tremendously successful aquatic group. They it developed after the KT extinction. If we want to be particularly snotty, uh, the whale could say, well, look at you plesiosaurs and mosasaurs and ichthyosaurs. You all checked out, but we're going strong. Well, um, those marine forms uh, existed from the Triassic down to the Cretaceous. So we're talking about uh, over 100 million years of success. We don't know long term how successful the whales will be. Uh, we know that they've been around. They were really starting to kick into the field about 55 million years ago. Uh, that's a pretty good run so far. And they've had their little ups and downs and, and, and uh, circumstances like 
uh, some of the um, uh, uh, the mega sharks that were going after whales and whales going after sharks and all of that and great diversification that's going on. Uh, how much of the little fossil record on the cetaceans is unknown because they live in the sea and so the, the stuff isn't there. Virtually all of the material are stuff that has to land in an environment that eventually gets pushed up onto the surface so that you can have it erode away and then you can dig it up which is why uh, Pakistan, which uh, used to be beachfront property before India slammed into it, was once sea. And that stuff is where so many of the fossils showing the early traces of whale evolution were taking place. Uh, once they developed as an aquatic form, Basilosaurus, the, the one that looks kind of like a long snake-like thing uh, and uh, has some um, uh, flippers up front, little vestigial legs and that times behind, uh, and comes in varying sizes from pretty good size up to quite good size. Uh, I think 40, 50 feet long, I think for some of them, the basilosaurs. Um, they, they exploded worldwide. And so that you see the proliferation of them uh, outside of the zone. So you've got examples of them in the, uh, um, oh, uh, I think in the, in the shrinking uh, um, Neobara Seaway uh, and uh, areas down in Chile and that. So they make it to the Americas and they're all over the place. Um, now, to what extent any creation is going to, is going to ever be able to make sense of any of that biogeographically. Um, oceans in general are a mess to try to work out uh, from a young earth creationist context. And the intelligent designers don't give a rat's ass for them, except other than just harumph how complicated they are. And so that's the von Sternberg thing. Oh, <laughs> ah. oh yes, yes, yes. Plucked a nerve. Yes, indeed. We. Go for it, go for it. A lot of old factories in North Carolina have been repurposed to a nice effect, mostly textiles. Yeah, that from my mind, I, I think it's in part because I, I was kind of imbued with the spirit uh, that my mom's generation had that went through the depression and you just didn't waste stuff. You repurposed things. If you if you had a thing that, that uh, shelving or something that you, you weren't gonna use anymore, you found out whether somebody else in the family could use it or find a way of repurposing it and turning it to some other function and not wasting stuff. And that what applies on an individual case, I think should apply as a social issue. That to me, nothing is sadder than a, than a big dusty vacant lot with a fence around it saying to, to let. It, 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 can't something be done with it? Can't you use it? Uh, can you turn it into a thing that can help um, with with uh, local uh, uh, farming or uh, uh, areas to make parks? Or uh, uh, it's just like wasted space. Um, and of course, then you have the environment of, the, of bringing things back into a natural environment. Uh, the the uh, layers of asphalt that we have that don't um, let water seep in means that as many, quite a few cities now are discovering with the uh, flooding from global warming, uh, that um, their sewer system and drainage systems can't handle that. Uh, they become waterlogged, uh, overstressed, and so they start backing up and you have flooding and water in your basement or in your first floor up to six feet. And uh, nothing, nothing more fun than mildew after a flood, isn't it? Um, and so the idea of restructuring so that you have swales and the like that can allow water to drain off, even though you're in an urban environment, plus you've got greenery and it looks prettier and you've got put trees up and all this kind of stuff that it's actually more aesthetically pleasant, plus it's generating uh, uh, oxygen that uh, um, and, and sequestering carbon footprint. And there's a whole bunch of interconnecting things. So um, that's all part of the, oh yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, the uh, that, that's another um, bit about the the whales. Uh, some got hungry for krill, while others kept teeth and became killer whales. Yeah, although um, uh, technically, yes, the 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 killer whale is actually the largest dolphin species. And uh, the way you remember that is from the fact that whoops, uh, whoop, there we go. Um, that um, whales don't really have much in the way of dorsal fins. Whereas the dolphins all have those little things sticking up from them. You think flipper or, for that matter, killer whale. Uh, so um, that's the easiest way to tell. And even though there are some echolocating whales and the like, you know, the belugas, which are actually a whale, they look a little bit like some of the dolphins that have similar kind of features in that, but you look to see if they got a big dorsal fin or not. Um, the, uh, the tooth structure is really fascinating because just as with the hair issue, um, all toothless mammals have the genes for making teeth. 
they've just been disabled and in one form or another uh, still are lurking around in there and can be induced. Uh, that's more of that putting the gas tank on a Tesla thing. Uh, oh, yeah, a couple of picks on that. Um, that I think what will, will have to be the case, first of all, there'll be a lot of it from the grassroots up. And there's another matter of making use of um, market forces so that it now becomes profitable to do that. Now, to some extent, um, there's a, a potential awkward downside of things that, that suddenly are raising property values in the area and change the tax distribution and, theref and therefore makes them, you know, gentrification that makes it harder for poor people to live in there. And that means there has to be a, um, a, a broader sense about how taxes are constructed and how um, mix of uh, groups within a city uh, operate. And it won't be easy. And there's probably going to be a lot of different approaches to it and everywhere. Uh, there's probably no one size fits all. Uh, and but it will require the people kind of pay attention to the fact that people are involved and physical spaces are involved and long term sustainability is involved. Now, some people who have difficulty thinking about even one thing at a time may have problems with that. And people like that probably should not be in political office. I can think of the George Santoses and Marjorie Taylor Greens and all of that. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so, sorry about that. Yeah, unfortunately, um, uh, useless turds are frequently elected to political office. And uh, that is one of the little problems. It's not a new phenomenon. It's been around uh, for quite a long time. But um, uh, the only way around that is uh, grassroots organization and political action and, and working out viable candidates that will be able to put up an alternative and persuading people to do that. So hard to figure out. Um, that's, uh, that's what makes life so complicated. Now, of course, we can always approach it from the emperor Caesar decreeing what shall be done. But in the long term, that doesn't work very well either. So um, it's, it's up to us. We do it by all the decisions that we make, by the products we buy, by the uh, people that we vote for, by the extent to which we research issues before we vote for people, let people know about things uh, uh, in this area. It's all a collective effort and will require all of us pulling together. So, um, you know, I buy an engraving machine. Well, that's something I must confess. I have never owned an engraving machine. And so I'm assuming you have an activity in your life that makes an engraving machine a thing that you need to get. Uh, and I hope it's a very good one. Well, anyway, uh, we managed to blather on for about uh, 47 minutes on there. The connection is held up pretty good. Uh, we should probably uh, wrap that up here. So to reprise, we've got uh, a really delicious little technical paper on the whales and as a teaser to the big whale section that's going to be in volume two. And then we've got um, more interesting genetic material from 2012 and 2018 on uh, the issues about metabolic pathways and how they're originating early, some of which are go way back in the history of life, and then others are developing more intricately afterwards in the mechanism of that. And always bear in mind on reading those things, is any of this being done by anti-evolutionists? And the answer is no, it isn't. And if you left science to them, all you'd get would be the kind of stuff that you can see in Jensen's book or Frank Sherwin at... Um, uh, Institute for Creation Research. So um, everybody uh, stay safe, uh, make sure vaccinated and all that kind of stuff um, and um, uh, explore the world and do wonderful things and shameless plug, get my books, get my books, get my books. Um, you can get some to give as donations to local libraries. Uh, you can, uh, um, whatever it can do, because the old RJ can certainly use the royalties and we'll keep up writing more of them uh, to the extent that we are encouraged. So uh, anyway, uh, everybody stay safe, except no wooden penguins. No offense to penguins, but the wooden ones we don't want. So see you all next week and uh, we shall 